thought that that's who's teaching it. Yeah, good. Well, let's talk about. So, we've been doing these impedance methods, and they can be used to do something that we learned about way back in mechatronics as well, which we did use something similar back then uh, to find equivalent sources and transfer functions. Okay, so that is the topic of the first lecture today. So we're just going to learn this by, uh, we're going to look at the example problem to motivate it, and then we're going to look at a handout to remind ourselves of what an equivalent source is, a Thevenin and a Norton equivalent source is, and then we're going to go ahead and do the problem. Okay. So, first step is to read the problem for the ripple filter circuit shown. So it's an RLC circuit, and we're going to put a load on it, RL. Find the Thevenin equivalent source model for the filter find the Norton equivalent source model for the filter, and find the transfer function from uh, VS to VRL. Okay, So that's where we're headed. So we want to remind ourselves what the feminine equivalent sources are. So see if we can do that without looking at a handout first. Can anybody recall? Yeah. I mean, that's essentially it. What it, it. The theory goes, so the, the Thevenin theory goes, you can write any, any network of impedances um, and sources as a voltage source and a series uh, impedance. Now, this is, uh, back when we introduced it first, we only considered um, resistances, but it actually holds also for impedances more generally. And since we're working with impedances now, and uh, we're feeling confident in it, uh, we will do the same thing for um, general impedance situation. So, all right, we are going to look at this uh, handout though, just to kind of give ourselves a little bit of a I'm working on a tweet there, apparently. I forgot about it. Uh, OK. So let's go to the website. And let's go to resources. And let's go to impedance notes. So here's that table of all of the different impedances for the different types, for the different types of elements. Here's how to do the series combination. Here's how to do the parallel combination. And we're going to do an example of the across and through variable divider thing. Turns out you can use that across variable divider or uh, voltage divider rule in this general case as well. And that's what the second example is going to be about. Lectures ni lecture 19 is about that. But we might use it today too, uh, or not just today. We might use it in this in this lecture as well. Um, Thevenin's theorem, though, and Norton's theorem are the two that we are most focused on in this problem, right? And that's summarizing this in this handout. Which I like this handout for this reason. That's why I give it to you guys because it's like really just condenses everything down, everything about impedances into two sheets. So. Um, you can write any linear network um, as a uh, as a voltage source or a cross variable source in series uh, with an equivalent impedance. So then we have to remember how to compute what the equivalent impedance is and how to compute what the equivalent voltage source is. And that's this thing reminds us of that. The equivalent impedance is the impedance of the network with all sources set equal to zero. 
So for a voltage source, how do you set a voltage equal to zero? So one way to set a voltage equal to zero is to just connect a wire across it, right? Because you can't have a voltage drop across a, an ideal wire. So that's what we do. We short out all of the voltage sources. And how do you set a current source equal to zero? Open it. Just open it, yeah. So just open the circuit. So no current can flow. Because current can't flow through nothing. <clears throat> At least I'm not going to posit that it can. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to do that to find the equivalent uh, impedance. Then, uh, finding a cross variable source, VE, um, what we do is we look at what the, what the cross variable or the voltage, in the case of electronic systems, would be across the open circuit terminals of the network. So we would say, what, is the, what would the voltage be at this output of the circuit? So we actually have to do a little analysis to figure that out. <coughs> so that's what we have to do there. For Norton, it's just essentially the sort of transpose of all of this. It's the dual of all of this. So instead of a voltage source, we have a, uh, or instead of a, an across variable source, we have a through variable source. And the equivalent impedance, though, is exactly the same. So uh, yeah, we'll find out what the through variable would be if you were to close off this, this, uh, these output terminals. So that's what we see here. Fe is what, what current or what crew variable would flow through a wire or a, um, a, a connection between these, these two. So that's our method for each of those. That's just sort of to jog our memories, because we're doing essentially the same thing we did before. But instead of with circuits, we're doing it with with a linear graph, we could do it more generally with a linear graph, and that's what we're doing now. Okay, so the first part says of this problem is find the Thevenin equivalent source model for the filter. So how do y'all want to start? How should we do it? Mm, you want to find the equivalent impedance first? That's what I want to do. So first off, we know that this is going to, hello. Guess I should plug it in. What do you think? So. So for part A, whoa, did you guys see that too? That's just me. Yeah. So hopefully that was a fluke. Okay. Whew. So for part A, the Thevenin equivalent means that we're going to be able to write this as a, an across variable source, or since it, <coughs> since it is actually a circuit, it's going to be a voltage source, right? Um, and a, uh, an impedance, Whoa. an impedance straight, there we go. So that is our goal. And then all we need to know is what is ZE and what is VE. So there's our source. So let's find ZE first. We need to set all of the what's equal to zero in this. Oh, first of all, we're working with, we're looking for an equivalent source model for this side of the circuit, the left side. This load side is going to see what happens when we have this equivalent source applied to it. But uh, we, want to, we want to say, okay, this is too complicated. RLC, 
So much happening there. We want to write this as a single source with a single series impedance. So that's our goal. This left-hand side we're going to rewrite as this. So we're only going to deal with this left-hand side of the circuit for this first part, for parts A and B. So what is the equivalent impedance of this circuit? What's our first step? Set what equal to what? All the, all the impedances for R L C. Well, that is that is one step we could take, but we we circuit wise we need to we need to zero out all of the sources, right? That's our first step. So let's do that. Let's just re at least we redraw. We don't have to redraw it, but I like to when we start just to remember what this is going to look like when we when we zero out the source. So we zeroed out the source, meaning we shorted it because it's a voltage source. And then we have the inductor. And then these are the output terminals. It's important to keep track of where your output terminals are. Your capacitor. And that's all. So that's what you get when you zero out the source. And let's just call the ZR, ZL, and ZC, okay? What is the equivalent impedance in terms of these Zs between these two terminals? So on this, this part, they're just in series, so sum them together. So, all three of them are in series? ZC is the output. Is that what you're talking about? So, Whenever we talk about series in parallel, we always are looking at it in a certain perspective. There's two nodes connecting. So we're always keeping track of these output terminals. And what we want to know is what is the impedance between these two output terminals. Okay. And so if we're going to do that, the impedance is going to be affected by this path, the ZC path. And it's also going to be affected by this other path, the ZR, ZL path. So those two paths are in parallel with each other. And ZR and ZL are in series with each other. So we need to combine those in series and then that combination with ZC in parallel. Do you guys follow that? Good. So ZE then is going to be the series one is pretty easy. You just add ZR and ZL, right? So ZR plus ZL, and then it's in parallel with this. So let's use the simplified formula for the parallel. If you have two impedances in parallel, you can do the one over, one over each one, but then it, it always simplifies down. It's kind of nice to jump to the simplified one, if you can remember. So it's Z1, Z2 divided by Z1 plus Z2. That's the simplified one. So let's start with that. Let's just, let's just start with that. And we're going to say, so ZR plus ZL. So that's the one side of the parallel impedance times the other impedance, ZC, divided by their sum, right? So ZR plus ZL and then plus ZC. So uh, we could plug in what these are, but we could also just, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say uh, this is the answer where ZR is equal to what? What's the definition of just R, yeah. Uh, what about ZL? LS. And what about ZC? One over CS. One over CS. Um, and that's a complete answer for what ZE is. We should simplify it if we're going to do anything with it. But just to answer that problem, it's just algebra to simplify. So <coughs> I'm just going to list those. So that was easy enough. So we have ZE. We need to find VE, which is 
in general, um, it's a little bit, so we could go through uh, circuit analysis, we could go through our full thing, but I'm going to encourage you to start using, if you're just caring about the transfer function or you're just caring about finding something in terms of its impedance, um, to use this nice trick, if it's a simple circuit, use the across variable divider and through variable divider rules. So we could go through the analysis using the continuity and compatibility equations uh, and the elemental equations, the generalized Ohm's law version of the elemental equations, where everything is just an impedance. So it's, everything is just V equals IZ. Capacitor is that, inductor is that, everything is that. So we could go through that, uh, but we also could just use these rules. Just like the voltage divider, we can know the answer really quickly without having to go through all the steps. So cross variable divider, uh, this little sheet shows you. So it, it shows a case of three, but you could have n series impedances with an across variable source across them. You can find out the transfer function between Vs, the source, and any of the Vs of these impedance elements by this expression. Just select the one that you want, the impedance of the, of the element that you want the, the cross variable output to be. So V2 is related to Z2, and then divided by the sum of all of the other impedances. So just like the voltage divider, if you want to know the voltage across R1 and you have R1 and R2 in series, then the voltage across R1 is just equal to the voltage source voltage times R1 divided by the sum, R1 plus R2, right? This is essentially the same. So let's use that. Let's use it because we can go through the circuit analysis. We don't want to. We can just skip right to what VE is. So VE is going to be whatever this voltage is on these output terminals when you put the voltage source back in. You, you can't do it with this circuit. You have to put the voltage source back in. So what is the voltage across these output terminals is the question. And it, when they're left open. So any ideas on, on uh, uh, how to go about finding that? output voltage, that VE, since we just did the cross variable divider thing. So we want to know the voltage across one of the elements of this, these uh, resist, or these impedances, and they're all in series here in this sense. Um, there's a voltage source across three elements that are dropping the voltage. And we have we care about the voltage across this capacitor because it happens to be the voltage out. Use the voltage divider equation? Yeah, so let's just use that voltage divider equation, which says that, that, so all right, voltage divider. Says that we can take, uh, we, we know the relationship between uh, V, um, so it's VC, I mean VZC I guess is the way, uh, VC I guess is the way we should write it. So VC over VS, so that's the voltage of the capacitor over the source voltage has to be equal to the ratio of the impedance of C, right, in the numerator, so ZC, divided by, in the denominator, you have to add up all of the impedances, so ZC plus ZL plus ZR. And 
that tells us that VC is just equal to ZC over ZC plus ZL plus ZR times VS. And we also want to write that this is Um, so VE equals VC, right? So our equivalent voltage, which is what we're looking for, equals this capacitor voltage. Okay, whew, not so bad, really. I mean, we didn't plug in what ZC, ZL, and um, uh, ZR are, but we could, and we would have the expression. So. Zero differential equations were done in this. Um, we just got right to, we can get to a transfer function between uh, the input and any of these outputs using this cross variable divider in a series circuit, which is pretty nice. That's a nice trick. We're going to keep using that, and I encourage you to start using that trick on your homework. Um, okay, B. So, the Norton equivalent circuit is going to be a current source IS in series with an impedance, some equivalent. Oh no, in series with? Am I right? Parallel. Parallel, parallel with. Yeah. I was wrong. In parallel with. Uh, Z E. Now, we could go back and recompute Z E, but we know it's the same, right? Z E is the same for Norton and Thevenin, so we don't have to zero the sources and do that. It's the same ca calculation, so we don't have to do that again. We just need to find what I E is. Sorry, I wrote I S. I meant I E. We need to find I E. And if I was to go through that procedure directly, I would have to put a wire between these outputs, because that's this procedure that you do, is you short the output, and then you ask what current goes through the output. And we could find that current using um, just pretty straightforward circuit analysis. However, there's a nice other nice little trick on this handout that I want to show you. Um, that is, that you can transform between a Thevenin source and, an equi and uh, a Norton source by just setting Fe, or in this case Ie, equal to whatever Ve was divided by Ze. Since we already have Ve and Ze, we don't need to compute anything. If you already have the, if you have the Thevenin, you can convert to the Norton with this formula. If you have the Norton, you can convert to the Thevenin. So you can go back and forth, whichever way you want to go. So once you've computed one, you don't need to recompute the other one. So if I ask you this on an exam, like to compute the Norton and the Thevenin, don't compute them separately. Compute one of them and then transform it with that relationship. So what it said is that IE is equal to VE divided by uh, Z E, right? And I do not feel like plugging that in, but there's because so V E is this expression, and Z E is this expression. It's gonna be kind of messy, but that's just algebra. I mean, a lot of does cancel. It's, it's it's not gonna end up super complicated, but the expression initially is gonna be pretty big, and then it'll shrink down. So it's, it's not bad, it's just that I don't want to do it right now in class because I just don't feel like it. Uh, and then C, so part C of this is to find the transfer function between the source voltage and the load voltage. So, so then we connect up the load here and we need to find that. Now, we could 
start from scratch and find that transfer function. Okay? But we happen to have these Norton and Thevenin equivalent sources. Um, and it's actually easier if you use one of them. So, should we use... The, so one of them is better than the other. We want to know the relationship between Vs and VRL. Okay? So we could... Um, so, in one of these equivalents, if you think about it, you can relate, you can relate whatever source you have here in, say, the Thevenin equivalent to the load source using the voltage divider rule really easily because they're just going to be in series, right? In this case, if you just connect it up directly, this is not, so there's these two are in series, these two are in parallel, and so then you have to like simplify it before you can do anything. So using the Norton equivalent or Thevenin equivalent might actually be easier here. I have a hard time with this because you can cut this in any number of ways. You could either do this with the Thevenin or the Norton or with just going straight for it. So one way just might be easier. Yeah, I mean one way might just be a little bit easier. I, I mean it's almost six or half a dozen I think in this case. I, so the Thevenin is the most, I think, straightforward way to go uh, because you're going to have a voltage source in series with an impedance and then you're going to connect the load so there's going to be another series impedance. So it's just a voltage divider. But that relates VE to the load voltage, VRL. Then you have to use this relationship here between VE and VS still. So you do have to do that last conversion. Is it VC or VE? Uh, this is VC, but they're actually equal yeah. to each other. So, yeah. Um, this is uh, that's one way to go. I don't recommend the Norton because you're going to find the relationship between IE and a parallel uh, load out here, which is going to be, you can find that relationship, but you're going to find the, the current divider rule, or the through variable divider rule is right here. You're going to find the relationship between the currents, the through variables, but you want the, ones with the relationship between the cross variables. So I wouldn't recommend that route. It's not uh, that you can't transform, you can transform with this relationship, so you can always do that, but it's kind of like doing extra work. So I wouldn't recommend that route. But another way to go is just directly. Just say, okay, these are an impedance, these are an impedance, call them Z1 and Z2, and then you can do the uh, a cross variable divider that way. So let's actually do that. Let's, so we could do any of the three, but let's do the last, the last suggestion here. So we're going to do cross variable divider. So we need to in, it's make these into Z1. So we'll write Z1 equals, you can write it down at the bottom of the page. I just want you to visually be able to see it while I write it. So Z1 equals, it's going to be in parallel, so it's ZC, ZRL, divided by ZC plus ZRL, right? They're in parallel. We can use that little formula there, one step sh faster than the one over formula. And then these ones are super easy, right? So. I don't know why I called that one Z1, this one's Z2, but I did it already, so I'm going to stick with it. So Z2 is going to be ZR plus ZL, right? They're in series. So let's say that those are defined. Then if I want to know what, for C, what V 
uh, VRL, well, I mean, technically this is V1, since I've called that element 1, the combined element 1. Um, V1 over uh, Vs is equal to Z1 over Z1 plus Z2, right? And V1, by inspection, is just VRL, right? V1 is this combined uh, parallel impedance here. So this, this voltage across C and across RL and across the combined ones are all the same voltage, right? Uh, how'd you get the Z1 over Z1 plus Z2 yeah. piece? Uh, the last oh, down. this one? Yeah. yeah, so now that I have got, so I'll rewrite what the circuit looks like once I combine those impedances. So that is an intermediate step we should probably do. So there's our, uh, our voltage source. And we now have uh, Z2, I called it. And this is our output voltage still. Um, Z1. So I want to know what uh, I want to know what V Z one is. So V one is um, because V one is equivalent to V R L, right? Okay. Which is what I want. I want the relationship between V R L and V S. So this is the output voltage that I care about, and this is just another voltage divider or a cross variable divider rule. So I know the relationship between Vs and V1 is Z1, this impedance, divided by the sum of the two impedances. So it's just like if we had a resistor here. Like if this was like R2 and this was R1, then we would have written back in mechatronics, we would have said, oh, then that means that V1 is just equal to R1 divided by R1 plus R2 times the input Vs. If you divide both sides by Vs, you get V1 over Vs equals R1 uh, divided by R1 plus R2. So just like that, but we're doing it with just generalized impedances now. So this voltage divide, or, or the cross-variable divider, it doesn't have to be voltage anymore, but the cross-variable divider rule, and the through-variable divider rule, and the source uh, impedances, all of that stuff is just really useful stuff to, to go through. And because once you can sort of just uh, mold these circuits, or these linear graphs, however you want, um, you can find the relationships between any two variables pretty easily without going through the whole analysis. You can go through the whole analysis and you could find these. And I actually, I think the last example, um, well, I might I might do an extra example anyways, but you can always write down, so it's important to note with all of this stuff, you can always write down your elemental equations as impedance equations, right? We found what the impedance of each of these uh, elements is from their elemental equations. Do you remember we did that last time? Um, like we said, like we found that for instance, that ZC is equal to 1 over CS, right? And we found that from the elemental equation that DVC DT is equal to 1 over C times IC. Remember when we did that? And then we said ZC is just the, the impedance relationship between V and I. 
Oh, we stuck the S in for the DDT stuff. So every elemental equation can be written as, remember generalized impedances, this is the same generalized Ohm's law, it's V equals ZI. So you could go through and write that elemental equation for every one of these elements, right? So V <laughs> R is equal to R times I R, right? We could say that V L is equal to Z L times I L. Those are the elemental equations. We could write all of those down. And then we could write down all of the continuity equations and the compatibility equations. Because those, once again, you can say, oh, well, OK. Uh, there's a, you know, these two share the same through variable. They have the same current. Well, that's because we know that from a continuity equation, that everything into this node has to leave that node. So we can go through that whole process, right, like we have done in the past. Um, and we can get all these algebraic relationships. And all these algebraic relationships can be, uh, you know, solved simultaneously for what you want. And that is fine. That method is totally fine. Uh, it is generally like the way to go. If you're going to do a problem sort of right, you probably should just do that whole thing. But if you want a sort of quick and dirty way to your answer, a sort of way to get to the transfer function between a certain input and a certain output, um, you can sort of skip all of that and use these equivalent sources, use these impedance... Um, uh, sort of like the, the, the cross variable divider rules, those sorts of things, they get you to the transfer function quickly. And that's the, the big advantage, I guess, to working with impedances is that you can get, well, it helps you conceptually to understand problems sometimes better because you understand each element as a sort of impedance and how is it impeding the flow of the, of the through variable, that type of thing is good. But your, beyond the conceptual aspect of impedances, it's this ability to get straight to a transfer function uh, without ever having to go through and construct an entire model with elemental equations, and continuity equations, compatibility equations. I mean, those things all do work. Um, but it's sort of these shortcuts, it allows you to use these shortcuts to things, which I like. I, I think they're very much worth learning. So if I'm going to look at this big modeling problem, and so like a student comes in and they're like, okay, I want to do this problem, this modeling problem, it's like fifth order, and they're like, yeah, I just, like, I don't know how this, yeah, what I really care about is how this one input affects this output. That's what I care about. I don't really care about all of the dynamics. Well, we'll just, like, I, in five minutes, I can find what the transfer function is between us. I mean, it would take a lot longer to do the whole state equations and, and use the H is equal to CSI minus A inverse B plus D formula to get all the transfer functions. You could do that, but it's not always what you need to do. Sometimes this is totally sufficient, just finding that one transfer function. Then I might be able to find out that, for instance, um, the response characteristics, which we'll talk more about as we proceed with the transfer function, what kind of response characteristics you can get out of this, um, just straight from the transfer function. So we're going to talk about things like resonances soon and all of that, and that frequency domain stuff all falls from the transfer function. So the transfer function is really powerful. We haven't really used it for powerful things yet, but it's, it is really powerful. So being able to find that transfer function quickly on a problem is really beneficial. So I just want to stress that I actually have decided to do the last example offline because um, it's just more of the same. But I, I use a, a two-port element. I use a uh, trans, couple transformers in it. So I'll go through that 
offline, well, online, offline, online. Uh, so that you guys have another example, and I'll think about maybe doing an additional example as well. Um, because I think that having these examples for you guys to just go through is going to help you on the exams and stuff to, like, to review or when you work on your homework to see like, okay, but I didn't see a, a two-port element come in. Like, how do you deal with a two-port element? So, so uh, I only do a, a midterm and a final in this class. So the midterm exam is slotted for week eight right now. So week eight is right before spring break. And then, so I wanted to give you guys a test before you go on spring break instead of after you come back from spring break, which would probably really suck for everyone. So I'm like, Monday when you get back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I will not be doing that. I have a minor medical procedure on Friday before that Monday coming back from spring break. And I'm not going to be like in the mood to make you guys do a test probably. Anyways. Yeah, or grade them. I want that to be done before. So, cool. Well, uh, have a good weekend. Uh, I, I'm going to post the...